So hello everyone, thank you very much for um, for joining us today. I know this has been the second time as we are trying to do this webinar, so I hope this time it's going to go way better. Um, my name is Oksana Panochenko. Uh, I work at Aids Action Europe, um, and we are a network of around 420 HIV service organizations. And pricing affordability is one of the topics that we are trying to actively work on. Um, in case you cannot hear me, or in case you have any questions, or in case I'm talking too fast, please write it in the chat and I will try to, to follow the discussion. Um, so before we start, I would like to have a small presentation and talk a little bit about uh, Aid Section Europe work in the field of affordability. Um, I'll share my screen. One second. So hopefully you can all see this. Um, so, as I said, we are Aid Section Europe. Um, so, uh, our steering committee uh, of Aid Section Europe identified affordability of healthcare with special um, focus on prices of medication and diagnostic is one of the priority fields of our work. Uh, so this resulted in 2015 in development of training manual for organizations and activists. Uh, I would like to thank Tamas Beretsky, who made a huge contribution to this, who worked with us very, very actively on this topic. Um, um, this manual is available on the clearinghouse of Aid Section Europe, and you can easily download it and use it for your work. It's really, really, really good tool. Um, so based on this manual, uh, we conducted uh, six regional trainings for activists and people working in the field. Uh, five of them were in English, and one of them were in, was in Russian. Um, so, in 2016, we conducted three trainings. One was uh, in Riga for Baltic countries, one was in Belgrade for Central and Southeast Europe, and the third one was in Athens for Central and Southeast EU countries. Uh, so, in 2017, uh, we had another three trainings, again, based on the manual. Um, this time, they were two in English, and one, uh, one in Berlin and another one in Athens both for the Southern European EU countries. Um, this, is what, this was due to very high demand from the region. And the third was, was conducted in Kyiv in Russian language for advocates from the EECA region. Uh, for these purposes, the manual was translated in Russian and it is also available uh, on our website. And here I would like to thank Sergei, who was one of the trainers in Kyiv. And I think that was a very, very interesting experience as for us, as for participants. Um, so, in 2018, um, with the experience of conducting the regional trainings, it became quite clear for us that the language is one of the main barriers. Um, so, with this in mind, our steering committee decided to move more to the national trainings and national languages. Um, this was reflected in our strategic plan for 2018-2021, which is also available on our website and where you can find out what exactly we are doing and are planning to do. So in 2018, uh, the training manual was updated and it received new chapter with training guidance. It is also openly available on our clearinghouse, so you can again find it, use it, please, it's, it's a very useful tool. Um, so based on that, in 2018, we conducted um, uh, two training for trainers. Uh, altogether, we had uh, 12 people from 10 countries uh, who participated in the training for trainers. Um, for 2019, we had two uh, webinars planned. One was a webinar on global intellectual property schemes and regimes. We had speakers Tama Beretsky and Dr. Sabina Fokler. Um, the recording is available on our website, on YouTube. It's also quite interesting and you can check it out and listen to it. And also we had planned for this year, for basically previous year, but now we're doing this this year, second, second webinar, which are, we are now conducting. So hopefully it's going <laughs> to work out better than last time, which we had to cancel during the, during the webinar because of the technical issues. Um, so um, thank you very much again for joining us. And with this, I'm going to give word to Sergei. Okay. Hello, everyone. And sorry again for this um, short technical trouble. So my name is Sergei Golovin. I work with the uh, International Treatment Preparedness Coalition in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And we are an organization basically working with treatment access issues in um, the former Soviet countries, so the countries of Eastern Europe and Central Asia, so basically the Russian-speaking region. 
Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the community and civil society involvement in medicines pricing and affordability in ESA. And I would like to thank Oksana for inviting me to speak at this webinar. And um, sorry again for the technical troubles last time. Hope there won't be any this time. So, OK, let's uh, do the next slide. OK, first of all, I have no conflict of interest to disclose in terms of in terms of treatment access. So please, next slide. And um, this slide is really important as I have to thank, uh, I, have to, I really have to thank a lot of organizations uh, working uh, with uh, HIV and HCV and TB treatment access issues all across the region. And uh, it's really, it's really um, encouraging. And it's really great to see a growing network of national organizations, patient-driven organizations, really digging deep into treatment access issues. And those you see on the screen are just some of them. They include Patients in Control in Russia, 100% Life, Answer Foundation Kazakhstan, Anti-Hepatitis C, Partnership Network in Kyrgyzstan, Positive Movement, People Plus, Positive People, I mean, a network, and many, many other organizations. These are just the ones which are involved in some of our activities, some of our joint activities. But there are many more organizations really actively working to promote treatment access issues, and I'm very grateful uh, to them for this work. So uh, next slide, please. So this is how I'm going to structure the um, uh, presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, I think you can type them in 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 this uh, box uh, to your right, and I'll try to cover them either during the course of my presentation, maybe at the end, or when we're going to have a question a session, Q and A session. Well, hopefully there will be answers too. Uh, so I'll do a very brief overview of some HIV treatment access issues in ACA, about 10-15 minutes. Then I'm going to target some civil society interventions to improve access to treatment. And then we can have a short discussion about how any of these examples can be uh, used in the context of Central and Western Europe, or maybe indeed uh, they are already being used there. And uh, we need to share our experience to uh, mutually benefit um, each other. So next slide, please. So part one, next slide. Um, some basic facts about the epidemic I wanted to underline before we um, continue with our specific work. That's, I think, really important to understand a couple of things. The first thing is the HIV epidemic is still rising in our region. And here you can see some of the statistics, which I have taken from the UNAIDS website. So, very good um, uh, resource. Uh, it's you can you can see a link uh, on the bottom of your screen. So epidemic is rising. The tempo is uh, slow, but 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 this is pretty alarming. So um, uh, and it really has to be taken into account. Uh, although there is an asterisk here, and that based on very preliminary data, there is a trend towards declining. It was observed in Russia in 2019. So based on the current data, we actually see a decline in the, for the first time uh, over many years. Um, this is a more positive sign. But if you are, if you look at the statistics, which is like available and it's pretty official, so uh, the epidemic is on the rise. So it's a big epidemic, and it's another thing which has to be borne in mind. So we have around uh, 1.7 million people living with HIV in our region. So it's close to 1% prevalence, 0.9% uh, prevalence, as opposed to 0.2% prevalence in Western Central Europe and North America. So the difference is very big, and the numbers are really big. And it all influences uh, the treatment, um, the HIV treatment programs and the advocacy work we have to do. Uh, luckily, the AIDS-related deaths are slowly declining, and this is a more positive trend. So this is a very brief overview, so please, next slide. Uh, as to the HIV treatment cascade, this is an overall cascade. Uh, it has to be underlined, but um, 
72 people who know their status and 53% of those on IRT, so a little bit more than a half, and 77% of those with a suppressed viral load. Uh, this brings us to the conclusion that we have around 38% uh, of people on ART of the estimated number of people living with HIV. So around, um, around 648.5 thousand people in 2018. So the, 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 there is a rise, um, so you, you, you see it clearly uh, in the slide. Um, of those, Russia is a very big number. So uh, mid-2019, we have 472,000 people on treatment. So as you see, very big numbers. And 38% only on treatment of the estimated number of people, meaning that we have to treat many more. So we're already treating many people in the region. So Russia and Ukraine are, of course, the two largest HIV treatment programs in terms of numbers. So we're treating a lot of people and many more people have to be treated, uh, which uh, has some implications for our treatment uh, programs. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, some very broad overview of the um, HIV treatment access issues we're currently working with, and this is by far not an exhaustive list. Uh, Dolotegravir is uh, important because it splits uh, the region of Eastern Europe and Central Asia into two groups of countries. So the first group of countries which has access to generic Dolotegravir and which uh, have um, good opportunities in terms of uh, low prices and uh, quality assured generics to really fulfill the new WHO recommendations and to improve the treatment standards and to bring integrase inhibitors into the first line of HIV treatment. And there is a second group of countries which are not eligible uh, for uh, procuring generic drugs. They're not included into the voluntary license between the patent holder, VEEP Healthcare, and the medicines patent pool, medicines patent pool. Uh, so, um, uh, we, um, we see that those countries are Azerbaijan, Belarus, Kazakhstan and Russia as a second, second line. And uh, the prices for the first line there is way, way higher than the prices of the countries which have access to generic first line drugs. So they are above 1,000 US dollars per patient per year and uh, meaning that the budgets of these countries cannot really afford um, procuring dolotegravir in large quantities enough to supply uh, all the people in need of first-line integrase inhibitors. This is a very big issue and I'm going to talk more about it in detail a bit later when we come to the uh, session about uh, in intellectual property and treatment. A lot of things happening in our region in terms of intellectual property and access to treatment and pretty exciting to see these developments and uh, I'm happy to share some of the very new information in a little while. Lopinavir Ritonavir, surprisingly, is still an issue in terms of prices and patents and access to heat-stable Ritonavir, which is um, an obstacle for access to other protease inhibitors, such as atazanavir and darunavir. And lopinavir ritonavir is pretty much the most widely used second-line drug still in our region. And, 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 and generally, we see a very limited access to second- and third-line drugs in pretty much all the countries, maybe with the exception of Russia. So we see a very limited use of darunavir, atazanavir, raltegravir, rilpivirin, and uh, obviously, uh, one of the key barriers um, is price. Um, as to other novel generic uh, drugs, uh, integrase inhibitors, we see an opportunity of obtaining generic Bictegavir whenever it's uh, available as a generic. And uh, recently, maybe some of you heard uh, the information about uh, one of the Indian companies registering uh, first generic uh, Bictegravir. I don't remember whether it was a com I think it was a combination combination drug. 
So, and most of our countries uh, are eligible for procuring generics within the licensing agreement between uh, um, Gilead and the medicines patent pool. So hopefully this will be an option, although there are many discussions happening now whether Bactagravir actually can be uh, a good replacement for Dultagravir and uh, the position of WHO is clear here that um, this is not a 100% substitution and Bactagravir is an interesting option but it has, it has limitations in terms of its use. So this is by no means a full solution to the problem of access to Dulotagravir. So this is just a short list of some of the issues we're facing, some of the issues we're discussing among ourselves and with various stakeholders. And um, uh, in a little while, I'm going to show you the tools which we use to uh, gather data around our arguments and how we basically try to deal with uh, treatment access um, issues in our region. Is, are there any questions at this particular stage? Shall I continue? Mm, so I'm not, I don't really like, like talking uh, for a long time, so maybe if there are questions, I can address them already at this stage. Why, Nicoletta, why, why, why? Why there is no access to generics? Good question. Uh, okay. Um, Dolotegravir in uh, most of the countries is patented. Uh, uh, and a patent uh, means a monopoly for the patent holder. And the patent holder, well, in, in simple words, in, in these countries, uh, so basically Vive Healthcare, the company has the rights to do whatever they want with Dolotegravir in our region. And they concluded um, a licensing agreement with the Medicines Patent Pool. This is uh, an organization. Um, okay, I see another question. I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna address it in a little, in a little while. Um, so, within the scope of this licensing agreement, uh, some countries uh, have access to generic drugs. So there are um, companies which are able to produce generic drugs under this licensing agreement and sell them to a certain number of countries. Uh, mostly uh, low income countries and uh, lower middle income countries. Some countries of our region are in this agreement. Georgia, Ukraine, Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, some others, Moldova, I think. So they can procure generics under the terms of the licensing agreement because the patent holder allows them to. And other countries, including Azerbaijan, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Russia, which are upper middle income countries, they are not allowed to do this. And since they have patent protection, they can only procure branded drugs. There are solutions to this problem, such as compulsory licensing, but I'm going to talk about those uh, tools and all those methods in a little while. But uh, just to illustrate the difference between the prices for generics and the prices for brands, I can say that. Um, for example, uh, under the current price VIF is offering to Russia, we can, I, th I think it's around 1,300 $1, US dollars per patient per year. And uh, generic drugs cost around 60 US dollars per patient per year. So the difference is pretty striking. Okay, I hope this answers some of this. Uh, uh, I hope this answers. A little bit the question you you asked okay uh, where did you say there is almost one percent uh Alexander, can you go back a couple of slides uh okay yeah here yeah. so uh this uh, 0 0.9 percent prevalence uh, i'm referring to the unaids data for the for the region on the on on the whole so this is the data I obtained, so you you're more than happy to double check so there are different uh uh, the different numbers for different countries, I'm sure I haven't um, really uh, looked into detail uh, as to each particular country, but this is an overall uh, prevalence for the region of Eastern Europe and Central Asia I obtained from this uh, resource. You see it uh, on the bottom of the slide. Okay. 
All right. So let's um, let's get back to some of the monitoring tools, uh, and then maybe discuss. Uh, great, um, you're welcome, and discuss some of the um, uh, some of the um, methods we use to improve access to treatment. Next slide, please. And uh, yeah, so these are the brief conclusions. So the epidemic is on the rise, although there are some very preliminary indications that the tide is turning, but we have to see whether it is confirmed. Uh, the 1999 targets are far from being achieved, although there is progress. It has to be admitted that the countries have made progress, and some of the countries have made more progress than others, uh, but uh, still there is a lot of things to do. A scale up of treatment coverage required, among other things. I have to I have to note that here I'm going to talk only about treatment access, but this does not mean that we don't have issues with diagnostics and stigma and other things we always discuss. But here I'm very much concentrated on the treatment part. So the scale up of treatment will be required if we are to achieve the 1990. But of course I'm aware that this does not happen without adequately adequately addressing diagnostics prevention and other aspects of HIV response so pricing is a key issue for a number of key drugs in some of the countries including Russia and Ukraine and we have stockouts observed in some of the countries including and possibly not limited to Russia and Kazakhstan and we've recently received some information about well not stockouts but signs of uh, treatment shortages in Belarus uh, with regard to dolutegravir, so those um, situations practically um, emerge here and there. And uh, in a little while, I'm gonna talk a little more about what we, as civil society, do about them. Okay, next slide, please. So part two: community monitoring and advocacy tools. With this in mind, with uh, having in mind these important things that we are treating many people so remember this is a very large epidemic 1.7 million people living with HIV in the region and over almost uh, 650,000 people already on treatment so we have to provide a bit more uh, we have to treat many more people and at the same time we have to maintain new standards of treatment um, where there is new data there are newer drugs integrase inhibitors in the first line it all uh, requires a variety of tools. So the first thing we as community do as we monitor, as we monitor and advocate, and uh, here in the region we have a very extensive project aimed at uh, monitoring the situation with treatment access. And we monitor two key parameters. So one of them, next slide please, is uh, IRV procurement and provision. So basically, it's one is IRV procurement and the second one is IRV provision. So first, we monitor whether the patients are actually receiving the drugs. This is what we call like stockout monitoring. And for this, we have a very um, um, well-established, I should say, system. Although it's very simple, maybe that's why it's well established because simple to establish uh, and this is uh, pretty much where our um, uh, treatment access efforts started back in 2009 and 2010 where there were huge stockouts of drugs in russia so back then the activists established what they called this uh, periboy in russian stockout in english a website uh, trying to collect the data as evidence to talk to the government and say that there is a problem that has to be solved. And the second thing we're monitoring is actually procurement. So we are trying to understand in detail what the government is procuring, at what price, in which quantities, etc. And this project we have uh, implemented in many countries. Well, I should say not we. So uh, we started this project in, in Russia uh, back in 2010-2011 and um, our partner organizations uh, from the countries, some of them I mentioned uh, at the beginning of my presentation, they 
established their own uh, treatment monitoring projects in their respective countries, Armenia, Belarus, uh, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan. Georgia is asterisk because there's another organization doing this. We've not actually provided any technical support uh, there. And um, Russia, Ukraine. Um, so let's see what exactly we are doing. Next slide. So let's take Russia as an example. So we have over 1,000 tenders for ARV drugs and drugs for treating co-infection analyzed annually. So in reality, we, it means that basically uh, we have specialized software and we have dedicated people sitting at, beside the computer and analyzing tender documentation for ARV drugs. And they do this with a focus on a number of parameters. And first of all, we're trying to send what people are being treated with. Uh, this information gives us a lot of interesting conclusions, so to say. Uh, we try to understand how much the drug costs. Uh, and we also use comparison with other countries. Using simple maths, we understand approximately, I should say, uh, whether the quantities purchased are enough for all. And there are formulas uh, to, to help us. It's pretty, pretty simple. So we can actually see who is supplying and who is a charge, who are the people, who are the companies we have to target if something goes wrong. And we also see uh, dates of tenders, when supplies actually happen. And this helps us to um, be proactive in terms of uh, counteracting possible stockouts. So we can actually trace whether tenders are being late and we can uh, raise alarm if something goes wrong. So this, this is very important data we, we have. So after we've... Uh, uh, Nicoletta, there's a question. Do you have direct access to 10 documents? Are they public? This is a very good question. It varies from country to country. Uh, in Russia, all these uh, documents are public but public does not mean they're easy to find. So we had to undergo, we as civil society had to undergo some specific training on how to work with government procurement websites. So this is, the, it, it can be navigated by uh, maybe without training, but there are sort of important details to understand. So it's not as straightforward, but basically all this data in Russia is public. In Kazakhstan, I think it's more or less public. Some of this is, is public. Some, some of this can uh, should be, I think, obtained uh, via specific requests. And in other countries, uh, this data may not be public. So this uh, very mu varies very much from country to country. And the situation depends very much on the country legislation. But in Russia, it is, uh, it is public. And as far as I understand, for Europe, uh, it has been a question that the pricing data, for instance, the deals uh, companies uh, are concluding with uh, insurance companies, they're not they're not public. So the, actually, the price the prices are are not are not transparent. Whereas in Russia, the prices are transparent and they can be accessed pretty much by anyone who has the ability and the desire to do this. It requires some efforts. It's not as, as straightforward, but it's possible to do. Um, okay, so this uh, data um, is put together in a large, large, and I really mean large when I say large. It's about over 100 pages sometimes. It's submitted to the relevant authorities and published online for anyone to use. And I'm going to show you some of the examples in a little while. And uh, it's it's pretty fun to read. I mean, by people who for people to who are interested in in treatment access and and the drugs, and I, I know that uh, the documents we publish they draw a lot of attention, and we also work with journalists to well uh, to disseminate this data further, and of course we work with partner organization in in countries as listed before uh, to to make this data louder, so to say. OK, next slide, please. So uh, I think, Oksana, you, you will be able to share the, yeah, yeah, not necessarily now, but maybe later you, you will be able to share this um, 
uh, yeah, example. So this is a website in Russian, and here we see if you scroll down uh, just a little while, uh, yeah, you see a lot of different reports. So you click on any report, and you see an example of it in Russian. Yeah, for any any report. Yeah. Uh, so öffnen, which means open. I take it in German. So yeah, just scroll down. So this this is uh, treating hepatitis C in two thousand and seventeen. No, sixteen. Sorry. Yeah. So and down, 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 down. Doesn't matter. This is a large report. So basically, it contains all these uh, all this information: number of patients, comparison of different drugs, different regimens. It's very detailed. You see, bosepravir, tepetilaprevir. So it's a pretty old report. And this is about regulated interferon and different uh, producers and number of. Uh, vials purchase and the price per vial, so it's very detailed information, it's 44 pages already. Hepatitis C reports are much shorter than HIV reports, I have to say. So they're probably twice as short as uh, the HIV uh, reports. So thank you, I think this is just to illustrate what, 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 document we're, we're, what documents we're talking about. So we can get back to the presentation. All right, uh, next slide. Yeah, these are just um, some of the uh, some of the covers to illustrate. Next slide. And uh, here, uh, this is a, some. These are some of the conclusions we've come to. For example, uh, monitoring the HIV drug landscape in Russia in two thousand and eighteen. So we were able to calculate approximately how many people could be provided with ART based on their based on the procurement um, figures using some simple formulas. We were able to identify the key regimens, and the key regimens are as follows: we still have five hundred and six hundred milligrams as the most as the most widely used drug, and the most popular regimen is five hundred and six hundred milligrams plus tenofovir, plus lamivudin as single pills, uh, not uh, as a sing not, 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 not as a fixed dose combination. And around 180,000 people were receiving approximately this regimen in 2018. Lopinavir ritonavir is the key second line drug, around 92,000 patients. Atazanavir is the next popular uh, second line drug around 30,000 patients and at, the, at that stage dolotegravir was provided to around 14,000 people, well 15,000 people, a bit a bit less. And we have our own um, HIV drug uh, developed and produced in Russia. Well initially it was developed by Roche but then Roche sold the rights to this drug to a Russian company. It's called Elsulfavirin and uh, we are closely monitoring this drug because it's new and there is not so much data around it. It belongs to the same class as real pivirin, so it's pretty close to real pivirin, so it's non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. And uh, this draws a lot of our attention, so we had already around 3,260 patients in 2018. There will be more in 2019, and there were more in 2019 and there will be more in 2020 and uh, as said this drug has to be closely monitored by by the civil society because it's new and it was approved only in Russia and there is not so much data around it as of now hope there will be more in the future and yeah of course we see stockouts observed sporadically due to various reasons and um, now we're going to talk about how we deal with stockouts in a little while Next slide. Okay, counteracting stockouts doesn't work. Oksana, can you click on Periboy Rue, for instance? So when I said that this is a very simple and well-established mechanism, I actually meant that it's, it's really simple. It's based on a website. So the website, which is open for anyone to use and to leave messages uh, about stockouts. Uh, problems, for instance, if you here you, you see a list of problems, this is in Russian. For example, that you come to a clinic and the doctor does not give you the pills. Your regimen has been changed 
and there is no good explanation why as we say due to non-medical reasons maybe because there are no drugs at, available or you receive uh, not the usual quantity of the drugs uh, you receive a different dosage like syrup instead of pills uh, there are shortages of test kits they don't do testing etc etc so you see a number of lists and Oksana can you click on pollution is Sapshenia messages left yeah yeah and this is uh, this part is open to anyone but it's important to underline that this is totally confidential so it's only us who actually see uh, the name of the patient leaving a message and basically the patient can choose not to leave any contact details if they want to or they can give a completely random name uh, or they can choose not to give any name at all if they choose to they can uh, they can leave contact details for us to contact them directly i see there is a question coming up i will wait a little while hello 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 Elijah. There's no question, right? Okay, so I can continue. If, if there is a question, just type it and I will address it a bit later. Yeah, so this is how it looks. Uh, and uh, basically, Alexander, can you click, click on Svesi uh, Consultanta? Uh, uh, yeah, leave a message, basically. So this is a very simple form. And it's uh, very user-friendly. It's been adapted for mobile phones. Uh, so basically, you leave your name or nickname, doesn't matter, contact details if you want to, and a message or you can you can only leave a uh, wait, wait an email an email and a message and a message can be uh, well any message basically any problem which was described can you click on pollution is option here please for example so these are some of the some of the examples which are open uh, so entricitabine real pivot and tenofovir so patients receive different regimens because there is no drug in stock some try to buy them some try to change the regimen etc so next just 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 simple examples hepatitis c uh, uh, different di difficulties with uh, receiving access to drugs etc etc so uh, if you scroll down we, we're not going to do this now but if you scroll down you will see hundreds of messages and you can track them down to well, 2008, I think 2015, 2014. We've uh, done the rebranding of the site, so some of the older messages I think are not are not um, available anymore. But yeah, a lot of a lot of messages left, and uh, all of them are being addressed. Can you go back to the presentation, Aksan? Yeah. And we have similar websites uh, for Periboy KZ. Uh, yeah, see a question. I'll, I'm going to address it now, uh, which is for Kazakhstan, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, and in Belarus. And these websites are run by our partner organizations. The side effects, yes, yeah, some. It is possible to leave information about side effects. This is more complicated because. Um, uh, Although th there was an issue when people left messages about poor quality of the drugs, some poor quality of generic uh, branded medications because of the, um, uh, well, there was sporadic uh, information about that. And we actually contacted the manufacturer and the problem w uh, eventually was solved. And uh, we, as, uh, patient, uh, as a patient organization, we were involved into this whole process. So we tried to contact the uh, Ministry of Health and the relevant authorities responsible for controlling the quality of the drugs. And uh, sometimes we receive messages about side effects, but it's difficult to address them. Uh, and it very much depends on the situation. What kind of side effects? What kind of drugs? Are they like uh, regular side effects, for instance, for efavirenze or for lapinavir ritonavir, or are they not regular side effects or something to really um, um, focus on. So, but 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 theoretically, yes, it is possible, and yes, we receive such messages, and yes, we 
sometimes well we, we address all the messages but sometimes there are situations when we have to interfere i hope this uh, answers uh, the question there is another question coming up but generally there is a, an established um, pharmacovigilance system so uh, patients can leave uh, messages about side effects using an official website uh, but and i think we've already done some trainings to do that okay i'll just uh, continue and then wait uh -huh, you mentioned that some people buy what happens to the can buy migrants okay i'll address this is a good question i'll address it at the end of the presentation okay if it's okay so i, I i'll uh, keep it in mind and i will come back to the migrant situation uh, at the end of the presentation uh, or maybe or maybe not maybe now uh, because uh, uh, there are organizations patient organizations who have uh, who gather some reserves of the pills which can be given on a on an irregular basis to for example migrants who experience stockouts of drugs and who who are in need of um, extra extra supplies of drugs so some of them some of the migrants do buy uh, do buy um, medicines so this is but this is a this is a this is a complicated situation i i not the best uh, the best uh, expert on this particular uh, situation but what i can say now is yes uh, it happens that uh, yeah migrants have to buy of course medicines and but there are patient organizations who have some stocks of medicines which they can offer to migrants in special situations okay um getting back to the presentation so what we do so after we receive the messages so we um, have sample letters uh, which uh, makes our work simpler so we use those samples those templates uh, to basically inform the relevant authorities about the situation which can be different and uh, yeah of course the media also has to be engaged to draw attention to the issue of stockholds and we receive really receive hundreds of messages annually and uh, a lot of problems have to be solved but this is reactive so this is reactive tools here we are trying to react to the situation when it's already happened and when we do monitoring of tenders we're trying to be more proactive so we try to track the situation when it's not already happened so we for example see that the tender that there is some problem with 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 a particular tender so we already know that there may be stock out issues in the future so we can inform the relevant stakeholders in advance this is very important this is proactively done okay next slide please yeah what kind of messages can be left i've already mentioned but basically any message so no pills in the clinic change of regimen two pills instead of one uh, one pill instead of two <laughs> i don't know uh, denied treatment initiation for example if you come to a clinic and the doctor says tell, tells you well basically you can wait there's no need and if you really want to and the doctor still says that i'm sorry we're not going to initiate because basically we don't have enough pills now so wait a little while so these all are possible situations when you can leave a message uh, at the website and then the treatment activists will contact you and offer you some some kind of solution next slide please yeah some key principles so the key principles are it's a reactive tool as i've already said we work with every case so every case has to be addressed this is vital this is extremely important that uh, the people who leave messages uh, at the website actually feel that there's someone sitting on the other side on the other side of the line so every case has to be dealt with in one or another way so feedback is absolutely essential it's critical and we also publish our feedback on the website so anyone visiting the website sees that there are answers to all those questions left publicly and uh, it's, it's it's very important and builds trust it's always linked to advocacy and monitoring uh, data protection is really important so people feel safe 
and they can choose whether they want to disclose their data, whether they want to be contacted, whether they want to even go to the media, or they just want to remain silent and just inform us about the problem. But this is this is uh, very important. So the patients have to feel safe. Uh, sometimes it's used by clinicians as well. So basically it can be used by anyone who finds out about the problem. And it is effective. It is simple and very effective. It's lots of success stories. I'm not going to bother you with a lot of details, but just take my word for it. It is it is effective. Next slide. Part three. I have about maybe 10, 15 minutes and uh, to tell you about the intellectual property, the most exciting topic ever in the world, talking about IP and access to treatment. Next slide. So, oh shit, I've added some of the some of the new slides, but they're not in the presentation, but no, no worries. So basically, uh, can you go back to the previous slide? So before we dig into TRIPS, I wanted to very briefly tell you how it happens that we started to work with IP. Honestly speaking, I don't like working with patents and with intellectual property. It's a very difficult and complex and detailed issue, and um, it's not fun, so to say. But uh, importantly, I think in our region, we also see a growing trend and a lot of organizations, patient-driven organizations, trying to understand the link between intellectual property and access to medicines. And a lot of organizations trying to really influence the situation with intellectual property in their respective countries and trying to do something about it. And it's also a very exciting process that you see that we as civil society working with uh, treatment access, we've come from monitoring stockouts and helping specific people, which is a reactive tool. Then the next step for us was monitoring tenders and trying to look at the bigger picture to try and solve the problem when it's not yet there for the patients who receive the drugs. And then look at an even bigger picture to actually understand why the drugs cost so, so much why there are such high prices, why there are no registered drugs in the country. And this all brought us to the understanding that we really have to understand and work with intellectual property, really have to understand to work with patents and the laws of regulating it. And um, here we are, it's been five years now, uh, so yeah, so this is a very important um, topic and uh, here we are five years already i think we started doing some work in this field back in 2014 and um, now it's 2012 2020 and a lot of things have happened since then we started to understand what's what a patent is uh, what drugs are covered by patents what is compulsory licensing, what is voluntary licensing, what is uh, patent linkage, data exclusivity, all those uh, difficult uh, words, TRIPS, uh, TRIPS plus, those uh, words that in the end were very difficult to comprehend. Um, but now there is a meaning to them and w we know what they imply and uh, we know that they really uh, influence um, people's lives and uh, in a little while I'm going to show you uh, how we do this in our region uh, but um, while we're waiting for the presentation let's um, um, first talk about trips a very <laughs> another exciting topic um, for us I remember my first time when I started to work in this field, I, I had really had difficulties comprehending what TRIPS actually means. And um, this um, um, whole concept of different mechanisms uh, related to intellectual property. Uh, but in the end, now it's about some very specific situations. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, some of some of the trips... Um, yeah, this is the one. 
yeah, understanding the link between treatment access and intellectual property, believe in patient organization can and must intervene. And no intervention has already improved access to drugs. This is why patients and patents. So next slide, please. And this is the advocacy chain I was talking about. So we first did the monitoring and reacting to stockouts. Then we switched to monitoring and reacting to RV tenders, see a bigger picture, and an even bigger picture monitoring and reacting to patent issues. Okay, next slide. So for TRIPS, um, this large, large agreement between all the con many countries in the world for the World Trade Organization, and these countries agreeing to set minimum standards for protecting intellectual property. And this agreement, TRIPS, has a number of provisions that can be interpreted in favor of improving access to treatments. And this is called TRIPS flexibilities. And these provisions we're going to talk about in a little while. Anything beyond that is TRIPS plus. It's not required by TRIPS, but enforced within free trade agreements by means of extra lobbying. And there are also specific situations, TRIPS plus, which were happening in our region right now. And we are going to talk about them very briefly in a little while. Next slide. Uh, so the TRIPS flexibilities. So those uh, provisions in this agreement between the countries, the WTO, it allows countries to have compulsory licensing. It allows com countries to have possibilities to challenge patents. It allows parallel, uh, countries to have uh, parallel importation. So it has provisions which allows basically countries to bring in generic drugs whenever it's needed. And it's really important. And some of these tools we are already starting to use to improve access to drugs, for example, to dolotegravir. Uh, remember, at the beginning of my presentation, I told you about the patent issue and that there is a patent protection. So compulsory licensing, for instance, is now, I can't say being used, but Kazakhstan is trying to use this tool to bring in generic drugs. Um, even while there is patent protection. And of course, possibility to challenge patents and parallel importation of drugs is also, also being discussed. European Union is a good example of a market where parallel importation of drugs happens. Uh, and um, there are discussions about introducing a similar system in the Eurasian Economic Union. Okay, next slide. The TRIPS plus things happening in our region is data exclusivity, it's currently under discussion in Kyrgyzstan, and patent linkage, currently under discussion in Russia and Eurasian Economic Union. So these are extra, extra things that, are extra, that pose extra protection for patented drugs. And uh, this we're trying to um, counteract. Next slide. Okay, um, so this is we've talked about already. So uh, in relation to patent protected drugs. So we have an issue with dolotegravir in Azerbaijan, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Russia. We have a patent issue with Lopina Veritonov in almost all the countries of the region. Um, and here you see some of the pricing information. Some countries, uh, it's up to 50% of the budget share. Uh, so the country pays a certain amount of money for all ARVs, and 50% of this money goes to Lapina Veritonia. I think Ukraine was one of those countries. Uh, and here you can compare the originator price around 60 US dollars with less than 20 US dollars per month for a generic Lapina Veritonia. And of course, relatively uh, limited access to second and third line drugs. And again, we see a pricing and patent issue. So patent and then leading to higher price. Next slide. Um, just to illustrate the situation with um, some of the novel drugs at our um, markets. So you see, well, green is licensed or generics on the market, or no patent protection. Yellow, no license, patent can be an issue. So you see Russia is almost all yellow, although Lopina Veritonova generics are already on the market. This is a very controversial situation. Um, so a lot of green. I have to admit, but Dolotegravia is the one I want to draw your attention to, and Lapina Veritonovia, of course. So Belarus, Kazakhstan, Russia, Azerbaijan is not here, it's not part of the table, but still. 
So these countries have to try to use some of those TRIPS flexibilities if there is no good agreement between the patent holder and the country government. Next slide. So compulsory licensing is what some of these countries are trying to utilize. So it's basically use of an invention by government authority without the consent of the patent holder, including, but not only, in cases of public health interest, and remuneration is paid to the patent holder. It's fully in compliance with the TRIPS flexibilities, and there are initiatives to implement it in Russia, Kazakhstan, and these are related to clinically important patent drugs. Dolotegravir, Safosbovir, and I think Lapinavir is also. Um, it's actually a drug which has been uh, subject to compulsory license, I think, at least three times in history. Uh, I think Thailand, Indonesia, I think Ecuador. At least three countries use compulsory license to improve access to Lapina Veritonomy. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, an example of a campaign. So 12 countries must issue compulsory license on WHO recommended dolotegravir now. I actually uh, read some information about European countries and I, um, I was surprised that there were countries like Macedonia, for instance, that there were not so very good access to dolotegravir and also pricing was mentioned as one of the barriers. Next slide. Illustration purposes. Again, this is 2018 data, but trust me, not much has changed since then. Um, so the difference is striking, really. Uh, current price proposed in non-licensed countries is around uh, 110 USD per month. There is uh, There was a price offer uh, in Russia. Uh, I think uh, the exchange rate may vary, but it's around this, um, around this um, figure, more or less, if my maths is OK. Next slide. Yeah, later on you can read some stories in English about uh, this situation, mainly relates to Kazakhstan, because Kazakhstan, based on the information in the media, is the most active country now, trying to use compulsory license as, as a tool to bring in generics in the country. And I think uh, the Ministry of Health is very much in favor of this um, tool. Next slide. And also there are initiatives run by the civil society to oppose and challenge patents uh, which are currently in force in our countries. There is very large international experience and you can use this uh, patentoppositions.org website to see how many patent oppositions there were in the world with regard to HIV and HCV and TB drugs. There's a very large database, a very large experience. Next slide. And examples from ESA include Sofosbovia. Uh, there are cases currently run in Moldova, Russia, Ukraine, Lopina Veritonovia, Ukraine, TAF, Ukraine, Isla Travir, Ukraine, and TDFFTC, Russia. So there is, as you see, a lot of things happening in Ukraine where 100% life is a very active stakeholder, is a very active patient organization engaged in patent oppositions. And um, yeah, Russia is also part of this process. And I think there might be more patent depositions coming soon in other countries of Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And of course, you may be heard about uh, uh, Medicines du Monde opposing the patent for Sofosbevir in Europe. And um, there were patent disputes. I'm not sure whether any patient organizations were involved, but there were patent disputes around Truvada to TDFFTC in Europe. So Europe is also an arena for patent wars, so to say. And uh, civil society organizations are also involved in, to, in this process. Next slide. So basically, uh, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. So some brief conclusions. Um, around what I've said. Next slide. So what we need to do in the Eastern Europe and Central Asia and what the civil society organizations are engaged in is expanding treatment coverage in accordance with 1990-90 strategy. But importantly, we have to keep up the high, the high standards which are currently set by not only by WHO but, but, but EX as well. So we uh, we need to switch to integrase inhibitors in other novel drugs. We have novel fixed dose combinations coming up. 
So we have to deal with those um, two um, situations. So at the same time, we have many people to treat and many more people to treat, and we have to improve the standard of treatment. And this brings us to the idea that we probably need to be more flexible in terms of pricing and generic policies. Expanding coverage with dollar to aggravate price reduction needed, of course, and compulsory license can be considered. Um, Lopinavir-Ritonov is surprisingly still an issue for our region. Uh, if average 400 milligrams is another option we need to explore in our region in line with the new WHO recommendations. A lot of average 600 milligrams still used in our region. Uh, we need further studies of l this novel drug developed by a Russian company. New fixed dose combination, of course, and explore opportunities for generic dictagravir. Okay, uh, next slide. I think this is the Q&A slide. I hope um, you had some of the um, interesting information or you heard something which you can use in your work. If you have any questions, I think we have around 20, 25 minutes to um, answer them or to discuss them. Yeah, thank you very much. I actually, before people are typing questions, I wanted to ask you, could you maybe talk a little bit more about, about medicine patent pool um, as a structure and how to work with them? Kind of, if you can give sure. some general overview. Thanks very much. Yeah, the, uh, the medicine patent pool is, uh, well, an organization, a public health organization. I think it's fully funded by you know, Unity. And um, how they work. So they basically act as mediators between uh, patent holders and uh, uh, companies willing to obtain uh, voluntary license. So they um, try to persuade uh, large pharmaceutical companies to include licensing agreements and give the right to their drugs to, uh, to others. Um, they conclude licensing agreements, and there is, a, well, I think uh, there is a website. Well, I'm sure there is a website where you can access all those um, agreements, and they have uh, licensing agreements with uh, Gilead, with Beef, with BMS, uh, with Abvi, with for, for certain drugs, and uh, and these agreements are um, they cover certain countries in certain cases. And of course, there are disputes around uh, that uh, there has to be more countries covered by, by the voluntary licenses. And um, let's take uh, Dolotegravir as an example. So one of those licenses is Dolotegravir, and uh, this license covers uh, all low and lower middle income countries. And now there are huge disputes that there are upper middle income countries with a very big epidemic which also need access to generic uh, dolotegravir. So there are like, talks in trying to persuade the patent holder to expand the licensing agreement. All the licenses are transparent. They can be accessed online. I'm going to, I think this is the website. I'm going to type it. Yeah, I think. Uh, so here you can access, uh, yeah, if you if you type it, in the browser. Okay. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, we'll click on who we are and then what we do, for instance, click on what we do. Uh, products licensed. Mm, okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And scroll down and let's take, for instance, Dolotegravia adult, exactly. And scroll down, and you see a uh, information about this license. Scroll down, and then you see key features, press release, country list, additional information. So let's say key features, for instance. Yeah. So allows manufacturing of active pharmaceutical ingredients and finished formulation anywhere in the world. Pediatric license allows for sale in 121 countries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you see a. Uh, an overview of the terms of the license. So basically, you can navigate and choose any license and 
get more information about it and what countries are involved and how they can get access. So this is in short about the treatment patent pool. Can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Anke? Um, yes, we can. I think there was a moment that they couldn't hear you, but now okay. at least I can't hear you. Okay, so now it's okay. Is EPSI treatment, EPSI treatment available for all patients, irrespective of health insurance? Okay, um, I'll... IRT treatment, I'm going to answer about Russia now, but I think this this very much covers many countries of our region. Uh, IRT treatments available for all patients, irrespective of health insurance. So th there is a special government program in Russia for covering IRT. Uh, for Hep C, it's different. Hep C is more complicated, and I can't say that it's available for all patients. In fact, it's not. I think HIV positive patients are among the group are among the groups which are eligible for free of charge um, HCV treatment. But with HCV, it's much more complicated. I'm afraid I can't really even cover this uh, HCV situation in within like. More than three or four minutes, so it's, it's, it's a complicated topic. But let's say so RT is available for all patients, and HCV is not available for all patients. But for some group of, of patients, under certain conditions, it can be available free of charge. But uh, in reality, in Russia, there's very few, very few people uh, receiving HCV treatment, especially the novel DA based treatment free of charge. Uh, so, I mean, in comparison with the total number of people, I think we have around 15,000 people being treated annually, more or less. It is very, very rough figures, but this includes also patients who still receive regulated interferon-based regimens. And uh, the number of patients in Russia is much, much bigger, several million. No worries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? And before, and I don't know whether you have a response to that, but still I'm going to read it out loud. Could you explain once again the situation you mentioned about North Macedonia? No, the North Macedonia. Uh, I may be wrong, but I think it was Macedonia, but maybe may, may another country. But I, I heard that there was some central uh, European country where there were issues with pricing for dolutegravir. Maybe so, so there was limited access to dolutegravir because of price. I may, I may, I may be mistaken about the country. It may not be in North Macedonia, but some other country. But uh, maybe you have more information about it. Uh, do you have any information about uh, any central European country which has issues with access to dolutegravir because of price? I see a question about tests. I'm going to go to it in a little while. There's a question. This is my question to the, <laughs> to the participants. I actually don't have uh, this. Mm -hmm. I need other typing. Yeah. Yeah. Anki does now. Yeah. The question is uh, whether you know any uh, any country where there are problems with access to dolutegravir because of price. So not many people receive dolutegravir because it's very expensive. Yeah, but yet again, I I, I may have confused the uh, may have confused the country, but. At least it's uh, it's the case in some of the countries in Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, echoing Nana to what you've just uh, uh, what you've just written, I think this is um, this 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 is why for us this monitoring is so essential. Uh, this allows us uh, this monitoring allows us to track all the developments very closely. So we um, have very detailed information about the pricing trends, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the volumes of the drugs which are being purchased. We know more or less exactly how many pills they buy each year, how many pills of lopinavir, darunavir, atazanavir, ritonavir, doesn't matter, any drug. 
So we have all these detailed information. It, it really enables us to um, navigate through the data and it, it gives us good uh, foundation for our arguments. Um, There was also a question. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I missed. Maybe you already responded to this from Anke. Yeah, yeah, yeah I remember. I'm was... just just okay, waiting for the minutes. Okay. Uh, I, I remember Anke's question. I'm. I have a good a good answer to this question. <laughs> okay. Okay. While Nana is typing on drug resistance. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I understand. Okay, let's get uh, back to testing first. Um, we will be. This is our. <laughs> this is the question. So we, um, we are we are already monitoring stockouts of tests. I should say, and uh, patients in control in Russia were really actively involved into monitoring availability of tests back in two thousand. 12, I think, 2011. So back then there were um, stockouts of test kits in, in Russia, I think, and uh, a lot of inf information was published on the website. I think some years ago there were um, information about uh, stockouts of tests in other Eastern European uh, and Central Asian countries, and we were also involved in this process, but these were only reactive tools. So, if you remember our chain of advocacy, so first monitoring stockouts, then monitoring tenders, then monitoring patents. So, in terms of stock, in terms of test kits, we are at stage one, uh, gradually trying to climb to step two. So, we are now in the process of preparing a methodology for monitoring uh, monitoring availability of test kits, and this includes. Uh, and this is difficult because, because test case is a very difficult issue and uh, we want also to have this resistance um, testing monitoring included in our report. So we want to do viral load, we want to do CD4, we want to do resistance and maybe even screening but I'm not sure. So this is complex, so we are currently at the stage of developing a methodology for that. And I know there is uh, there is also an organization also working on it. I think in Kazakhstan. So there, soon there will be reports. Soon there will be reports on testing, and this will be stage two. And I think stage two, stage three will be patent issues. We'll try to understand what kind of um, situation there is with the treatment um, with IP. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I understand. I understand the, the why you why you ask the question. Yeah. Uh, so for our monitoring efforts, we'll try to understand the resistance as well, um, and uh, whether there is any information on drug resistance on ARVs. This is an issue our region is facing right now, and I think there are countries doing studies to understand the first line resistance level. Um, this is the best I can do for you right now. For exact details, I need to go back and have a look. Yeah, our monitoring efforts just continue in the work. Uh, cover for now HIV, HCV, TB, and we're starting to, to work with tests. This is what we, what we cover. All right. Any other final questions? Of course, uh, you're very welcome to contact me personally. I'm very responsive. If you have any uh, questions or queries related to our monitoring work or any other any other um, uh, questions, you need any materials in English, Russian about treatment access, I'm more than happy to provide them, either via with the help of Oksana or directly, whichever is more convenient for you. Yeah, Anke is typing them. Let's see if there is another question. 
Are you involved in the Minsk meetings? There will be another one. Yes, we were invited to the previous Minsk meeting. Just to, to, to explain for everyone what the Minsk meeting is. There was a ministerial meeting on uh, treatment access uh, in Minsk. I think the first one was 2000... Oh, shit. 18? 16? That was the one in 2016. Uh, 18 for sure. We were... Uh, invited to this uh, meeting, I think we had a presentation there on the results of our monitoring. Uh, also showing this uh, wonderful graph with uh, the difference in prices for Dolutegravir. Uh, I think I, this is an official information, but, uh, but to the best of my knowledge, I think there are plans to hold another Minsk meeting, but I don't have the details yet. This is, I think, the best I can answer for now. All right. Any anything else? Yes. Let's see. But if there are no further questions, then I think we can. Yeah, I will type uh, in a short presentation, and uh, I hope it was useful at least a little bit. And uh, as said, I'm very responsive. So please uh, contact me if you need any information about uh, uh, treatment access work happening in our region. And I'll do my best to provide an answer. Um, okay, then let's yeah, let's close this round. Thank you, Sergey, very, very much. I think it was very important, very interesting, and very useful to have this webinar. Thank you, Tom, for organizing it. Uh, it's, um, it's yes, you're welcome. <laughs> um, and yes, thank you, everyone, to, for joining us. Uh, we will have a recording. We will try to release it as soon as possible. And but in general, thank you very much for for joining today. Okay, thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye.